Hey everybody, we're here with Markets and Mayhem um, you're from MacroVisor and TraderAid. If you guys want to check them out, you can check them out on YouTube, Twitter, um, Substack. He's just about everywhere. Um, I've had him on a bunch of times. I've come on his channel and uh, you guys all seem to have a blast when he's on as well, just like I do. We always are chatting up markets. Uh, the other day we got in a great conversation about history as well. So uh how are you doing today man jason thanks so much for having me on it's always a pleasure to talk with you whether it's on mic off mic we have a lot of fun and i'm excited to be back yeah man i'm so glad to have you on uh thanks for fitting us in in the middle of uh, your busy schedule uh, it's it's cool to see i think something you know that just needs to be said even before we start it's been fun to watch you grow your following into what it is today you know and that as quickly as it was I think it's more to say about the integrity you bring into this business. Like you are a person who really is trying to teach people. You're still trying to learn. Like, you know, like you really have that thing that it, it isn't teachable. You know, it isn't teachable to teach somebody to always have an open mind, always be willing to learn. And also at the same time, put out this great content over and over again. And it seems like a lot of people have been drawn to you because of it. It's super cool to watch. Well, thank you, my friend. And, you know, early on in my journey, uh, growing into what I was working on, kind of trying to build here, this expanding of networks and being able to learn from other people and try to share what I've learned along the way, I was fortunate enough to meet you as well. And, you know, you've been a, a very generous resource with all the knowledge that you've amassed as you've become, uh, you know, a really proficient trader and a great fund manager. So, you know, kudos both ways, you know, along my journey, I've been fortunate enough to be able to meet a lot of great people. And Jason, you're absolutely one of them, you're top on my list, but also to be able to share a lot of information. And it's it's been fun. And it's great, because you know what, with finance and a lot of other areas of life, but it's especially true with finance and technology, you're just never, you're never done learning. There's, yes. there's never any point where you can say, you know what, I can just hang up my, my learning cap today. I'm, <laughs> I got it. I figured it all out. Yeah, I've got it. And at that point, you're in big trouble if you think that, right? <laughs> I mean, I was just kind of laughing about that yesterday. I had a, uh, a family friend hit me up and kind of asked me some questions about um, their kid starting account or, or something. And, you know, we were talking about, he was like, yeah, you know, I don't know if they're really into it, but I want to like kind of push him into it. And I was like, number one, this is a very tough way to, to make money. Um, yes, you can do it. Sure. It takes, but it takes time just like anything else. Like people, you know, if you were to become a professional athlete, nobody would say, oh, you could just start out and, you know, in six months you'll be great. Um, same with going to school to be a doctor or any of these things. Like it takes time. Everything takes time. And so, you know, kind of thinking about that, just coming into it going, okay, well, just like all these things, like you have to always be open to learning. And that's what I told him, you know, there's not a time, like I've been doing this for a long time, you know, both of us are, are way over a decade of experience now, you know, almost it's, it's getting closer to two decades. And even at that point, we're looking at it and going every day, you know, I could learn something new. We're always studying. We're always trying to learn. We're always trying to stay open-minded to it. Um, and that's the way you get good at this because markets are always evolving. Yes, you will have a strategy and a style. And at some point you will really stick to it. But the second you get complacent is this, when you start to get kicked in the head. And you don't want that to happen in the markets because it doesn't turn out like other things. You know, in sports, maybe you fall um and if you're in college maybe you drop a class <laughs> this is a little different um you can lose a lot of money so you want to continue to be consistent have that drive to always learn and continue to do so with other people like you said growing your network is a great way to do that reading books there's lots of people who came before us who are uh, really good at trading that wrote books about it many years ago and continue to still be open-minded all these years later I think that's one of the coolest things for me to see is, you know, we have some years of experience now, uh, some serious years, but nothing compared to, you know, someone like a Stanley Druckenmiller or a Trader Vic or a uh, Stan Weinstein or any of those guys. You know, these people have been doing it for over 50 years, maybe 60. So it's really cool to just keep that in perspective at all times. 
Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest things about it, too. You put it well in saying that, you know, this is a really difficult way to make money. And that's true because you should set expectations realistically for people that are coming in. You can't just be complacent. You can't just try something and hope it works. You really have to come up with a discipline and a strategy and approach markets through the lens of whatever you think about what's going on out there in the bigger world. You can't necessarily let that color your positioning in a way where you're missing out on opportunities or you're willing to take losses that you shouldn't. At the end of the day, the market is going to speak for itself. It's going to set the trends that we follow. And sometimes the news will follow it. Sometimes it won't. But making sure that we are not blind to what's happening in price just because of a narrative is really important. And that's one of the things that, quite frankly, it's difficult, I think, for people on social media to discern that, you know, there's this sort of very binary view, like whatever this post may say, even if it's just the data and the data doesn't look good, well, then the person posting it must be full port leverage short (laughs) with zero DTE puts. And if it doesn't play out in the next five minutes, then they're a charlatan. And it's like, you know, it it goes a little far sometimes. And and maybe I exaggerate, maybe I'm not quite honestly, but (laughs) the reality is that there's a lot of nuance here. And, and, And a great example of this is if you look at AAII sentiment as a measure. Yeah. And you have these really bearish readings. Jason, you and I know. Mm-hmm. And most, if not all the people listening know, the most of the world is long. Yeah. So when someone's really saying, I'm very bearish, what that probably means mm-hmm. is they're not adding to longs. It doesn't yeah. mean they're max short. It may not even mean they've raised any cash. Yeah. So, you know, when we look at those readings, I like to, and this is something that, you know, I use as a bit of my nuance in my in my process and some of the models I've built When I look at a reading like that, the only thing I'm concerned about that has like a low grade weighting, but it's still a weighting is a blowout in bullish sentiment. Yes. Because in bullish sentiment, now we're seeing, okay, maybe there's an excess in positioning. Can we then see it in the flows? Can we see it in the positioning? Can we see it in the charts? And if it all starts to add up to the same equation and then we see momentum shift, then we know there's potentially an opportunity. So it's like there's a process here. And I know that you and I, we, we encounter this kind of stuff. And I think it's important because there really is a lot of binary thinking. It's important to clarify that yeah. when we're looking at something and talking about it, it doesn't just necessarily mean we're like full port, long or short, based on whatever context is inferred from that post. We may just be making an observation or we might just be sharing information and letting people do what they should do. And And so the point is, that just as it is important for everyone out there to learn and to keep an open mind, it's also important to look at the world of finance as a massive amount of gray area between buy and sell. Yes. No, that's that's well said and, and very important. I think we run into that a lot. Um, more, more than anything in the world, like I can't, if I'm long, it's like I can't say anything that would possibly go against myself because that's the thing. <laughs> Most of the time I'm like, I'm long something and I'll get data and it's not, and like, not to mention, you know, the VIX is very low. And so you look at those things. And for me, if I'm thinking of it in my time frame, I'm kind of like, I don't really, you know, the sentiment, the VIX being so low, it doesn't bother me as much as it might other people. But at the same time, I might look at that and go, oh, well, you know, I should be ready for a pullback here, you know, like there's gonna, it's going to happen at some point, you know, it's not, nothing goes straight up forever. And that's all like, sometimes we're saying, you know, so it's, it could be as simple as that. And, you know, you're, you trade on all different time frames. you know, I trade on a couple different time frames, but I don't have anything that's that short term. So you have to, as, as you having your time frame, you know, that's a, the difference between a bit like a good trade and a bad trade for you. Uh, if you have this type of pullback so just understanding like you know we're getting a little bit stretched here i might run into a situation that could wipe out some of my profits uh, maybe i'll you know you might be a person who trims positions uh, out there listening right now you know you might be a person who uh, just gets out of positions at a certain point the biggest part about it is understanding like what are, what do you do as a trader like i don't care what what I do or what anybody else does, you know, like you don't care what we are doing. 
care about what your thing is and then how we can help you to identify those things or inspire you to build a platform for yourself or a system for yourself because that's that's more important than anything else when you're sitting there and going like oh i had a somebody wrote me the other day and said you know they were talking about like uh you know macro gurus and this guy and like honestly this has been the the theme of the last couple months this guy told me to be short and i'm short and now i'm stuck like Number one, if that guy's, if you're talking, yeah, there are some people who might be charlatans out there, but if they are not, most likely they're nobody's, nobody has enough money to continue to hold short forever. You know, like, like, like you're, if they had a position or an idea and let's say their system said blank and they end up, or what they usually do, not even a system, but their discretion says blank, they go short into something. And then they go, okay, well, you know, when this hits, if somebody doesn't tell you, you know, when this hits this level, or if you don't look at your own trade and go, when it's this hits this level, I'm out, you know, you're a charlatan to yourself. You can't put that responsibility on other people. Because at the end of the day, those guys out there, they're not going to give you your money back. <laughs> so, you know, there's never going to be a day where you're listening to the Motley Fool and they're going to say, well, sorry, you went short for so long, you know, here's your money back. Like, that's never going to happen. So you have to be, <laughs> <laughs> you have to be willing to come in and go, okay, well, here's my positioning. Here's the size of my account. Here's, you know, the amount. And that's, I try to talk about that stuff a lot, but I know that's not what the normal trader really cares about. You know, we were talking, I was, uh, you know, in your group the other day and we were seeing the same kind of thing where it's like, People and people in general, my group, your group, Twitter, everywhere, what they want to do is they want to go on and say, uh, you know, I went long here. So like in six months, they can be like, look, look at me, went long there. <laughs> you know, like it's like they want to like predict these things and tell people about it so they can come back and tell you how fucking smart they are. And really like <laughs> that, that's really not trading. Like trading is really like trying to catch that meat in the middle over and over again. Like what, it, you know, if you're, I don't care if you got long, let's say the, the NASDAQ uh, right at the bottom, but when it did start to change trend and started to move up and then you started to put longs on, like, were you able to catch that meat in the middle? And I also, from the other end, I don't care if you got long rate at the bottom and then sold it two days later and then tried to tell me in six months how great you did because you're still holding it long. Like, <laughs> like you know, there's so many different ways to look at it. Really, th what, I, what, we're, what I'm trying to get at is none of that matters. Your returns at the end of the year matter. Like your returns at the end of the year matter so much more than all that bullshit. And please don't get too sucked up into that because that happens so much where I watch new traders all the time. They get sucked in to this prediction game. And really like nobody has, I don't have any ability to predict anything. Uh, you don't have any ability to predict anything. None of us in the markets really have any ability to predict. We have probabilities and we try to get the probabilities on our side as much as possible put on the trade, use risk management and let it ride. And that's really the, the secret of trading. You know, I've talked about this with you before. I can't say how many times it's been, but I know like every real person who was to me, a trading guru, the people who are really good, talented, smart, I would come up to them and say, Hey, tell, you know, what do you do as a trader? Like, tell me like what you're doing, secrets, blah, blah, blah. Teach me your ways, basically, oh, master. <laughs> and they would all come back with the same answer, which was like a Van Tharp book of, uh, you know, risk management. And I would get so pissed. I'd be like, why are you guys all sending me risk management? Tell me the secrets. Tell me how to do this. I just need to know how. And, and, and they were the telling secret. you the secret. And yeah. that was the secret, you know, and that was the secret. And it wasn't until that really got beaten into my head that like, I just, instead of constantly um, trying to predict things, I started to really go, well, let's like figure out what a good system to use and then just work on my uh, volatility and risk management models over and over again. And as boring as that sounds, that's how you make money in this. It's not the cool stuff. Like I know you see on TV and you're like, you know, especially new traders, they want to get on TV and be like, I called that bottom, see me <laughs> or oils, you know, going to turn up right here. I got oil or, or natural gas. Like I got natural gas from the bottom to the top. Like those things sound cool, but 
and and I've yeah sure I've I've had some of those trades, but that's not what makes me a good trader, and that's not what creates returns year after year. Yeah, and you know, look, I mean, at the end of the day, when we reflect on trading, it's it's never been, and we've talked about this, you know, on and off mic a lot. It's 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 like you said, it's never been about calling tops or bottoms. That's an exercise for the ego. And it's dangerous because when one starts to flex their ego, they get tied to ideas. And when they get tied to ideas, those narratives prevail over common sense and over risk management and overthinking. And they can compel someone who's not experienced at this to take trades they shouldn't take, to make decisions that, you know, if they didn't cloud it with, I'm going to be right, then maybe they would have had a better outcome. And the most dangerous thing for a new trader is actually to be right when they're wrong. To be like, oh, I called the bottom and then actually call the bottom. And then, you know, you make a lot of money and you think, boy, I've got the magic touch no matter what I think, you know, <laughs> and, and you go through that process and you blow yourself up. And I've seen it happen countless times, particularly late 2020, early 2021. I saw a lot of people who did really well in that period. And then when the market got a little more difficult, they lost everything because they didn't have a process. And it was a time where you could literally throw a dart at pretty much any stock being talked about on Reddit or Twitter or otherwise and quadruple your money, you know? And, and so like that was a period of time that was extraordinary. And there was a tsunami of liquidity coming into the market. So it was literally like everything was being bid. Every asset you could imagine had a bid under it because there was so much money chasing every type of return that it could. Interest rates went back to zero. So there was no reason to touch a lot of fixed income unless it was risky. And so people were coming into all kinds of risk assets, whether it was crypto or derivatives of it, like NFTs or these SPAC stocks, EVs, growth yeah. stocks, ARC funds, whatever. And, and that created this very dangerous precedent. And it's interesting because we see a lot of that mentality coming back right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yes, it's worked. And, and kudos to everyone that's been, you know, kind of playing these high beta single stocks that have had these insane days on short covering and the sort of episodic call raids that happen when one hedge fund is blowing up another hedge fund. You know, <laughs> if you can take advantage of that, it's like, it's like pirate ships at war, right? At the sea, yeah. firing cannonballs back and forth with liquidity. If you can make <laughs> it, if you can make money doing that, you know, kudos to you. It's a dangerous game. I know Carvana was up 40%. Uh, just even pre-market today. I haven't checked on it in a bit, but I was reading the headlines and I'm looking at the short interest and I'm like, wow, that does look like high short interest. Let's look at the volume. And the volume was such that that short interest would be worked off in just over a day. And so context is key because a lot of folks will look at things at kind of like a two-dimensional framework and say, oh, well, the short interest is 45 million shares and that's 60% of the float. And that means the stock's going to the moon and it's just going to never <laughs> stop going up. And oh, it's like, but... You know, but that depends on when the shorts entered, what their margin of safety is, and how they choose to exit. But let's just say, you know, when you shout fire in a crowded theater, right, and everyone's trying to exit at the same time, that panic to the exits where people are just slamming the offer because they just have to get out at any price. The risk management guy is just like liquidated market, and they don't have a choice. If that's happening, if that scenario is playing out, it only takes about a day and a quarter because the average daily volume is about 35 million shares. On a day like this, it's going to be much higher. So this idea that we can just take one bit of information in isolation, like short interest, and extrapolate from it the size and velocity of any potential squeeze that may or may not play out, it's, it's a big problem. And I've seen it over and over again. In fact, people will just look at stocks based on short interest and decide whether they're going to trade them. But context yep. is key. So I would, and you would both say, like, don't do that anyway. That's a fool's errand. You're probably going to blow yourself up unless you really understand the dynamics behind it. You might get lucky, like in a period like this, and eventually lose everything. But what I would suggest, and I think Jason would echo, is instead of doing that, if that's what you're actually doing, and if you've done well, great, maybe look at other trades where you understand why they're happening and they can be repeated in multiple different market environments and broaden your horizons to different asset classes and capture that mantra mm -hmm. that it's not about calling the top. It's not about calling the bottom. It's not about sticking it to the man or whatever, any kind of <laughs> ego flex. It's not about lottos and Lambos. It's not about zero DTEs. Options that only live for six hours are not a trading strategy. They are a gambling strategy. Yes, it's is, about, yeah. yeah, it's about reproducing 
something that becomes a discernible strategy that you can do over and over again over time and get better and better at and expand upon to become a consistent trader. Because let's face it, being a good trader actually takes a lot of work. There's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of education. There's a lot of concentration in the execution. Now, once you get that all behind you, then you have your system in place. You know how to trade it. You've got your alerts, your automation or whatever. It becomes easier depending on your trading style. But as you get going, the biggest thing that I could say to everyone out there, having done this since 2005, is be patient with yourself. Never take shortcuts. Always be hungry for knowledge and tune out all the flexing, whether it's game posting or people showing off in private jets or whatever's going on. Just tune it all out because it's nonsense. That's not any good trader and anyone that wants to hang on to their actual money is not driving a really fancy sports car or showing off. In fact, the richest people that you may ever know, you're probably not even going to know they're rich. Yep. Yep. That's the damn truth. And that's the, the damn truth. And it, it's, it's hilarious to think that because, you know, I've gone around, I mean, a perfect example is my great, great uncle. You know, he was an autistic person. He has a very interesting story. He was kicked out of his family because they just thought at back then they just, you were slow. So they kicked him out of the family. Uh, he grew up fending for himself. And then he, um, ended up going to uh the military well you couldn't go to the military if you were slow so he ended up going to what was what was fema before fema and helping keeping the railroads running learned to be a mechanic um he started you know work, working as a mechanic working at boiler rooms had his own businesses started buying real estate started investing you know and the guy dies with you know like you know over you know eight figures easy um nobody would have ever known his whole life you know when we were kids we had no idea he would give us christmas cards with a, a dollar in it and it would say from bob and it would be his he could barely write so his name you know they back then he was left-handed so they broke his hand whenever he tried to write so he learned how to write his name and that was it with his right hand and so as he's going out there and he's uh using his right hand and he's using uh only able to really write his name like he was at the same time like amassing this wealth and not caring about it at all it was you know most people who amass wealth it's the game of wealth it's not a game of i want to show you how sick i am or i'm going to stick it to my friends or this person made fun of me 30 years ago it's it's nothing like that it's the you you don't need a nice car you'd rather go i'd rather the security from it and really if you talk to anybody who has a lot of wealth all they talk about is the freedom of it the freedom just to know you're not in trouble or your family's not in trouble if something happens to you or you know that that's the great thing about it so you know you have to start to be more introspective with those things and i think that also that self responsibility that self actualization both of those things i think come into play in trading more than anybody'd ever know because ego wise if your ego's in it at all it turns into bad trading and you lose money like yeah like your motivation should be to make money i'm not saying like you know i somebody said the other day to me like oh you know i don't i guess one of my motivations is to make money and you know he almost sounded like ashamed of it and that's not it like don't be ashamed of it that's that's why you do this like we all have jobs we all have things we do like this is this is a job to some people and so you know you need to make money for whatever you're doing so don't be ashamed of it but at the same time like realize that that passion and that drive has to be there to really do this well because when this gets hard and it's always going to be hard and it's going to get hard again when the good times it's going to get hard again at some time you have to have that passion to really get through it so you know if you don't love doing this you will quit when it gets hard and i think all of those things together is really what builds people who last long in this business and who don't because I don't know one person who's lasted long in this business who said it was a smooth ride <laughs> the whole way, you know, <laughs> like, like, it's, you know. Not, it's not a smooth ride, you're going to run into some things. But, you know, the people who I know, like, you know, the Jerry Parkers, the Tom Bassos, these guys who've been trading forever and been consistent and made all the money in the world, you know, many times, you know, that they, they've had a lot of rough periods in the middle of that. Um, 
And so they really enjoyed doing it. And once again, like there's no ego in it. You wouldn't know if you saw those, either one of those dudes on the street, you would have no idea that they ran, you know, hundred, you know, billion dollar funds. <laughs> you know, like I was going to say millions, but you know, we're talking billions actually. So, you know, it's quite um, interesting to really dissect that down because it's really the thing um, when everybody starts, that's the thing I see the most is this this idea of predict, you know, or a piece of news comes out and they go, well, that's it. Oil's going up or a piece of news doesn't come out and they go, well, that's it. Oil's going down. And you're like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> like, like I, <laughs> I know that like, you know, you you generally like, you know, let's let's talk real um stop. I'll stop being so abstract and let's say it in, in a certain way. You know, if you use a fundamental macro model you know you want to if you're looking at something like inflation well you want to look at the cpi you want to look at other measures of inflation and you want you don't care really that you know the one day move was up or down or or whatever or the analyst missed or the analyst hit you care that the rate of change is moving some direction so the rate of change is moving up most of the time that's bullish for blank you know, the rate of change is moving, moving down. Sometimes that's bearish for blank, you know, like that's how you want to build these systems. And the more you're just doing that, you start to get away from this. Like every piece of data is going to drive you fucking mad. And you're like sitting there <laughs> 30 in the morning and 10 in the morning and two o'clock and just like, like beating your head against the wall going like, I'm listening to the fed, the feds coming out. Like, you know, like I, I, I'm very happy to this day and like, yeah, I'm not a day trader. So I know that matters to people in the very, very short term, but as me not being a day trader, it's really nice to not be sitting there like stressed at every single data point that's coming out. Cause really in the end, like it doesn't change. Like, like inflation data has been coming down for this long and like the the inflationary assets are starting to kind of move up you know like it's like this isn't something that really is um the end all be all and at the same time the most important thing is the price action we don't get paid because the data for the cpi is going lower like and we shorted all like you know ags today and like got blasted you know that's that's obviously going to cost us money we get paid by the price action so what do we know about markets how do we uh tell how we should be positioned based on the price action and the only thing i really know in markets and the only thing i can really depend on is that trends exist and they persist and like as long as you understand that and relative strength you can really position yourself in ways that you're not just always running around trying to beat your chest and say, I, I look, I called that the CPI was lower. I called that the CPI was higher. Or like, I mean, how many people have you heard talk about manipulation every single time the market, like they call the CPA higher, they get it, CPI higher, they get it right. And they go, oh shit, you know, the, you know, the markets went the other way. That must be manipulation. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, just, it's crazy. <laughs> My, my experience with CPI has been uh, a, a couple things, you know, for anyone that's out there that's trying to day trade this first, you know, you've got to realize that there's probably some information leakage mm -hmm. because often is the case that there's a reaction, you know, anywhere between two and five minutes before the data. I wouldn't call it manipulation as much as just the flow of information isn't as well secured as perhaps we'd like to think. Yes. Um, but the other side of it and the more, more important dynamic with, every data release where there's any kind of hedging into it is what does that hedging look like? Like if we're going into CPI day and we see that that day's skew in SPX is unusually high, then, or, and, or I should say that the short interest is really building up maybe in the ES futures contract, but it's really more important to watch skew for this type of effect going into the release you're likely to see the opposite of what you think because look, if the data comes in hotter than expected, but it's not the end of the world, a lot of people that hedged for the end of the world are getting out of those hedges while they have any value. And that adds liquidity to the market, creates a counter trend pop in that moment. 
that can take some time to work off. And then it kind of depends on what are the other intermarket dynamics at that time? Like how many people were going into that release thinking it was going to be this, and then it ends up being that instead. And, you know, does that create other ancillary flows as people are covering hedges? Does that cause stops to get blown out? Does that then create momentum enough that we're breaking out of the opening range for whatever time period a trader is looking at five, 10, 15, 30 minutes. And does that make them want to go long based on momentum? And so you can get a bunch of different factors that it doesn't reconcile with the data. The data may suggest, oh, the market should really sell off, but you might have positioning in place that sets into motion a completely different type of event. And so it's like you said, price is important. And the other thing I would add into it is understanding the dynamics of flow and positioning on multiple timescales is really important too, because you can start to model it. It's not one of those things, like you said, it's not like a single data point where we just look at this and we know bullish or bearish, but it is something that we can contextualize within a larger model to get a sense as to what could this imply based on a different set of catalysts. If we get a bullish catalyst, so we're gonna have limited upside because people are very, very, very long in the market and versus if we get a bearish catalyst, maybe there's more tail risk. Those are you know things that we can add in, but going back to the subject of CPI, I think the biggest mistake that people make is thinking the market just reacts in real time to data and not thinking that, you know we've been in this game, everyone who trades anything of any size has been in this game long enough to know that whatever they're trading has certain volatility catalysts and you have to be prepared for them. And if you're going to stay in a position through a volatility catalyst, you know, your pedigree or your discipline or your system may compel you to hedge. So just be aware of that and how that affects price action too on multiple timeframes, particularly in those intraday episodes of counterintuitive price action. Yeah, that's gr great points there. I want to also get a little bit back into what you said about data. Because I, I I actually link to this and and I'll link to this in the the show notes, um, but I I I pointed this out. This is one of my favorite things, and I actually didn't see. I went online and tried to find it. it's a it's a thing. It's a from the Market Wizards interview with Bruce Kovner, and I went online and tried to see if anybody grabbed this anywhere so I could grab it honestly to use the quote to put on my uh, my page, and nobody did. So I had to get it from the actual book. So basically, the, the question that Schwager asked Bruce Kovner in uh, the Market Wizards book, and if you haven't read the Market Wizards book, you have to read the Market Wizards books. Um, is that to, uh, he asked, is that to say that virtually every position you take has a fundamental reason behind it? Um, and so I'm not going to read through this. I'm going to just kind of paraphrase. But the point of it, you brought up the fact that there's leakage of data. And so what Bruce Kovner says in, in a couple parts of it, he says, well, Russia is a really good trader. And like he kind of laughs and Jack Schwager goes, what do you what do you mean by that? And, you know, he says, well, there's always some information coming out beforehand. And the only way you're going to see that is in the price action. He said, it's not something that, you know, you guys think like some big trader might have that information. And that's not exactly how it works. Maybe BlackRock. You know, I'm just not, you know, nobody, nobody I know is there, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it, but, you know, it's, if, it, it, you know, possibly they do, but that would be it. But he says that, you know, Russia is a great trader. The United States are great traders. And like, he makes it jokingly tongue in cheek, but at the same time, he's trying to point out this fact. And what he brings up in this is he says, um, during the past six months, I had good arguments for the Canadian dollar going down and good arguments for the Canadian dollar going up. It was unclear to me the inter which, inter which interpretation was correct. If you put a gun to my head and forced me to choose market direction, I would probably have said down. You, the US Canadian Trade Pact was announced, which changed the entire picture. But he then talks about, but before that was even announced, the Canadian dollar USD broke out a certain direction. So he followed that direction before the pact agreement even came out, you know? So what we're saying is like, yes, you're going to have these time periods that, you know, things can coil and get really tight and you get a very range bound market. But when you start to see like, you know, think of just the NASDAQ right now, you know, we kind of had a great bottom set up coming into January, February, March, um, 2023. And that bottom started to break out to the upside. And when you that was before anything really happened. And honestly, nothing really has happened still fundamentally to really change it. But 
what I see when I look at a market that's breaking out to the upside, like the NASDAQ and continuing to move, is that data at some point is going to come out. You know, just as simple as, um, you know, the CPI data has been, uh, the rate of change has been down, meaning that the Fed might slow down on rates could be, could be enough. Uh, maybe it sees something past that. You know, I don't know what the market sees, but I do know that the market is moving a certain direction. And that is telling me a lot, especially if it's not just in the case like we talked about in, um, before about, um, you know, relative strength. Um, you know, and you're talking about people who made a lot of money in the periods where the market was just moving up all the time. You know, you, you don't know anything about yourself as a trader. If the market is just moving up and you're like, I, I made money this year. Like, number one, if you're not, you, you have to look at the S&P 500 and go, OK, or, you know, whatever index you want to link yourself to. You, there's uh, hedge fund indexes. There's all types of ones, whatever ones you feel like in, uh, linking yourself to. But you have to outperform those to tell you anything, you know, and that'll help you also in down years. Like when when when, when the S&P 500 is down last year, if you're having a year where you're up, you know, 10, 20 percent, that's a really great year. You know, the market's down 20 percent. So that's telling you that you actually do have a system and a way of trading that actually works in all different types of situations. Um and so when we're looking at this, what we're really saying is, you know, coming up with your system, your strategy is going to be the most important thing, because at the end of the day, if you're able to put all of these things together, you know, like I, for me, I like to have like a fundamental view, but that view is always based on relative strength. You know, like, for example, 2020, the market's moving down in, in a very sharp way, um, but semiconductors are kind of the outperformer at that time tech is kind of the outperformer at the time. And most of the time I'm looking for things when everything's crashing, I'm trying to see what's, what's falling the least. And when I see something like semiconductors are falling the least, uh, tech is falling the least, then you can kind of come up with a view, meaning, oh, the market, the world is shut down, but these companies like Amazon, um, Apple, Microsoft, and so on, and then these semiconductor companies that all these co companies are going to need are still doing well, you know, the, the, and, and I'm not talking about the actual company, right? Like, remember when I'm talking, I'm talking about the price because I, I fully believe the price is more important than anything because we only get paid by that. So the market's coming down. We're seeing that that's moving up. That's telling me that we have kind of a scenario where the, the world being closed trade is meaning more money is going to go into tech. And then, you know, as the months went on, that shifted into, all of a sudden, oil has a little bit of relative strength and energy. And then that's also the reopening trade. So, you know, you can kind of extrapolate these ideas using things like that. Um, instead of just going, oh, man, this is up or this is down. You know, we need to do blank. Like, you, that's, you, that's you letting the market push you around. You're never going to make any money letting the market push you around. What you, how you will make money is if you have a plan. You execute the plan. You know what you're going to do way before it happens. And also rehearsing in your head what it's going to look like if you do the wrong thing. Not that that it's, you know, you're, you're going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong and that's bad. It's so you react correctly to it. Like if I would have came in and, you know, most of the time relative strength is usually right. But if I would have came in and semiconductors in 2020 or semiconductors in uh, this year in 2023, if those started to be the underperformer, I would have to change my mind, you know, and, and like, I need to rehearse like what that scenario would look like. Would that mean that, you know, the, the opposite would start to happen and energy would take over again? Would that just mean a crash, you know, like rehearse all of those different scenarios, but also most importantly, following your plan. Like, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. I think that's the thing that people forget. I had somebody tell me the other day that trend following, you know, he tested some trend following systems and they don't make money. And I like, I almost like rolled out on my chair laughing um, and, and I don't want to be an asshole, but damn, that was just, it was, uh, it was super funny because that's this type of system. There's, there's trend following funds who've been around for a hundred years who still make money. Um, and so, you know, but somebody who looked at it in a very short term way would go, okay, like these systems are only right 30, 40% of the time they can't make money. 
which isn't true you know like you're you're basically you're you're looking for your positive expectancy like what how much can you make in the winning trades if you're making you know let's say 50 percent on a winning trade and you're losing two percent on a losing trade like, like obviously you can be wrong a lot um you know like not of the position but let's say you know a real a better number like 10 percent. you know if you're losing 10 percent, you can be wrong 10 or five times um when still only have one winning trade that's right so you know you got to look at that positive expectancy you got to be willing to be wrong because when you're wrong if you're wrong small it doesn't matter when you're wrong big that's when it costs you money. That's when you get into trouble. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's really also, it, it's just about, like you said, and what you've said previously, going back to the idea of understanding the personality of what you're trading by its volatility and sizing positions accordingly, mm -hmm. so that you have those reproducible uh, risk exits that don't drain your portfolio. And, and as the example you've given more than 1% per losing trade uh, mm -hmm. is, is one that gives you a lot of second chances in case you're still trying to get it right. And um, I think that, you know, going back to the idea of trading just as a practice, the other thing that I think is, is unfortunately missed a lot of the time is the idea that, you know, most of the time when you're kind of just getting started, it's probably better not to be in the trade than to be in the trade because you're still figuring out your systems. You're still figuring out why I should get in or out of something. So you're not going to spend a lot of time just putting on trades. You're going to figure out what qualifies a trade and you'll probably start with a handful of instruments before you even, you know, really start putting on trades that you learn and figure out how they move and figure out how you may be able to gain some kind of edge there. Because it's like you said, if you're going to be trading something or you're going to be investing and building a portfolio outside of, you know, index ETFs or so forth, you really need to have some way to quantify your edge. And year over year performance is, is a very important metric because if you're able to demonstrate, like, for example, if you're a traditional fund manager, long only U.S. stocks and you can beat the 500 best stocks selected by Standard & Poor's or maybe there's 501 in there right now. But if you can beat that, you're doing really well. And, you know, that's, that's just an example, but having those benchmarks gives you a way to understand more as to whether or not you're actually performing in a way that uh, is, is worth continuing, or if you still have a lot more work to do to even get it up to par. And so I've had the question asked of me, for example, and this relates to backtesting as well, why would I backtest something and try to find that my backtested strategy has better performance than the underlying asset. Like, what's the value in that? And I was looking at about 20 years of data. Yeah, no, no, I understand. I mean, I found it to be a, a, a curious question, but it was from someone who is newer to trading. Yeah. And so I, you know, I really wanted to make sure they get a good answer. So I said, look, you know, the biggest thing is when you're trading, you're going to be incurring commissions. You're going to have slippage. You're going to have to make sure that at the very least you can stay afloat with whatever it is you're trading against, right? Because you're trading against the long only strategy, whatever you're trading long against, you're trading against the idea of just buying it and holding it. Yes. So obviously like, you know, with stocks, it's a little different. You might want to look at total returns, maybe include the dividends and so forth. So you really get a good picture. But if you're trading something like a commodity, like a, a gold or oil, where there's no dividend, you're really just factoring in your cost of trading. Okay, so what does it cost me in terms of the fees, in terms of the slippage that I might incur, and then factor that into your back test as just, you know, rounding your, your results down a bit. And if you can get a great margin with that accounted for 10, 20, 30%, if not multiples, ideally, that's where you want to go in the long run, but at least have an edge of double digits. That's yeah. when you start saying, okay, now I'm starting to find an edge that I can repeat, that I can start trading against. And that's at the point where you can start to say, okay, you know, you've built the foundation. Now, many people may be satisfied at this point and I get it. You're like, okay, I found an edge. I'm good. I'm just going to keep doing this. That's, that's fine. But like, if you have a curious mind and appetite to do this, the passion to really love doing it, then what you're going to do at that point is say, okay, now I'm just starting to understand yeah. because now I've built like, just the ground floor mm -hmm. of what needs to be a much more involved structure. Mm -hmm. And once I have that built, I can start building out the first floor and the second floor and the third floor and, you know, decorate the interior. And the idea of that is 
then you can start building new testing regimes, start looking at different asset classes, different entry and exit and risk management strategies and iterate your system until you have viable methods to trade a number of different assets. And another point that you've made that I think is so important to reiterate is these are things that should be uncorrelated with the broader market, mm -hmm. right? You could always have equity exposure and that's good, but the majority of what one might want to do, particularly in an environment where there's been such a broad run and the indices, and there's so many opportunities underneath the surface elsewhere is to diversify exposure. So there's more uncorrelated uh, opportunities in commodities and bonds and currencies in other regional markets, sometimes even in specific sectors and industries, because the idea and what I love to do is, is pair relative strength versus relative weakness. Yes. I can't pretend I know where the market's going to go, but I can look at trends and say, you know what, boy, that uptrend looks really, really strong. Let me test this idea and see in this type of regime, how does something like this tend to perform over the next three, six, 12 months or whatever my time frame is. And on the other side, I can look at things that are getting progressively weaker and say, boy, that looks like a pretty well-established downtrend. What does it look like if I backtest this type of situation over time? And then if I marry these together, what's the individual instrument's relative volatility so I can make sure I size my positions accordingly? Because if one's more volatile than the other, I'm not going to have them be even sized positions. There's only some situations where I might be more inclined to do that. And so, you know, there's, there's always ways to take a existing approach that we might have, right? And this is why the open mind idea is so important and make it better and yeah. it may come through things that that you pick up from listening to jason and i it may come from watching a youtube video or it may come from you know going out and reading academic research or going into the field and interning at a financial place where you start to really see things right before your eyes but you know whatever your start may be and that's by all means an incomplete list mm -hmm. it's at least important to get started somewhere and not think you know everything yes. before you're really, you know, executing. And, 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 and it's also really important to just leave the ego aside. Mm -hmm. All these games, these exercises in machismo that we see online, all this sort of, you know, nonsense, it really just reinforces very bad emotional outcomes yes. because you're tying your well-being to how your portfolio is doing. And if you're pissed off or sad on a down day and you're, you know, jubilant on an up day, you're more likely in both situations to make bad decisions. And so not being emotional, like, look, the way I kind of hack my brain in that situation is I just say, look, it's a video game. That's my score. Yep. And if I'm doing well, I'm making new high scores. That's awesome. But it doesn't like it doesn't change my mood because the other side of it is if I'm not making new high scores or worse yet, my score is dropping. That gives me even more motivation to want to work on whatever's causing me not to win and not through a let me just upsize and gamble with a bigger position kind of revenge yeah. trading. Way, but instead, yeah. like if you're playing a game, you're incrementally increasing your score. Yes, And that's what trading should be. You're not looking for an up 50% or 100% day because in order to do that, you're taking an inordinate amount of risk and you could blow up. And it's more likely over time that you may blow up mm -hmm. doing that. Yes, Unless you're consistently like rinsing your profits out, you know exactly what you're doing. And I know there's some rare exception of people that do that, but they're in the very distinct minority. The majority of people that want to do this repetitively and successfully, you're looking for incremental gains. And it's just like a game where, you know, you go through level through level, you get to the boss, maybe you get a bigger score on one of these bigger trades. That's like beating the boss. But at the end of the day, you're just trying to increase your score. You got to take emotion out from money. Yes. Because if you tie your emotional well-being to how big or small your account is, you're just going to cause yourself to get into bad habits. And it may even work at first, but eventually it's going to hurt a lot. And you're going to find that if you just didn't feel like I'm having a really good day because I'm up or I'm having a really big, bad day because I'm down, you'll see the opportunities in that. Because sometimes on those really big up days, it's actually a time to start taking some profits and putting that money to work elsewhere. And sometimes on those really big down days, it's an opportunity to reassess what you're doing. Is it is it a good time to get more or is it a bad time? And now the strategy doesn't work anymore. It's time to get out. It's always important to kind of figure all this out, you know, before the trade and if we're in the trade 
then it's important to reflect on our strategy and decide whether the trade is worth adding to or taking away from or whatever makes sense for what we're doing. But at the end of the day, if we don't have a strategy, if we have no idea why we're in the trade, then we need to stop trading, sit down, figure out what it is we're doing and come up with that strategy before we get back to trading. Because I know a lot of folks just fly by the seat of their pants and look, maybe that'll work in some environments like the current one. But I'll tell you what, if you want to have some kind of long-term edge that you can repeat over time, you have to be able to adapt. You have to continue learning. You have to be humble and you have to find a consistent edge. And that means having a system. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, there, there's so many ways to to look at that. Um, you know, for for me, a simple part of my journey was un- the understanding of like, so I built systems. I've always built and back tested systems. I don't think the edge in it is just the number that it spits out. I think the edge in it is to have that. Um, once you learn it's a profitable system, have that confidence to continue to put on the trades. Yeah. But what some traders will will tell you, like somebody who's a systematic trader um, in equities, they'll say, oh, you should put a filter on. And that filter meaning like your system, like let's say it's a 100-day high system, you buy on 100-day highs. You only use that system when the market is over the 200-day moving average or something like that. What I found looking at that type of system is that that actually takes away from your profits a ton. So I started to think, hey, you know, what's another way to look at this instead of a 200 day moving average, which I didn't really find it create besides like it'll keep you out of stupid trades, which is a good edge to have. Like, for example, if you're long Enron and Enron start to get under the 200 day moving average, it started to implode way under the 200 day moving average. It just keeps you out of dumb trades. So I'm not saying it's useless. I'm saying I don't really care for it. But I look at something and go, okay, well, maybe if I added, um, you know, I just bought the three strong, like, let's say I'm just only talking about equities. I'm only talking about sectors. Let's say, what if I did that and I only took buy signals in the four strongest areas, um, you know, of the spider uh, ETFs and you back test that and then you go, holy shit, that works really well. And then let's say, you understand market regimes and you decide to build some sort of a model. I like price action based models, but I'm sure other people have created really good models using other things, but price action based model, understanding that we're in blank regime. This is what usually goes up in this regime. I'm going to take buy signals in this. Now you can't make it too narrow in that sense. Um, I found that if you make it too narrow, like let's say like what all these quad guys are doing nowadays where you have you know they're like if you do this it's only these five things and these five you can't make it too narrow but if you dice it up into kind of two spots going like okay let's say the market is bearish let's say inflation is trending down and growth is trending down like you have these things on your right that you would sell most likely maybe buy something like bonds or the yen or something and like on the left side, you'd have inflation growing, um, as well as growth moving up. And then you would buy these things on this end. And so what I found is that if you look at it kind of one of these two ways, either using relative strength, or this model of, you know, this fundamental style model, you can really add to your, uh, your system. So let's say a system is like, around a 50%, 60% win rate, and you, your system makes money, if you add some sort of filter of relative strength on top of it, that system's win rate ends up jumping by about 25%. So it's like, that's really like the, for me, that's kind of the journey that you go through as a trader. And then you start to buy more asset classes, understanding, you know, like you, what you just talked about gold might not have as many correlations to the market as, you know, one of these sectors in the S&P 500. So you add gold, you add all these different things. Now you're starting to come up with a robust, robust system that can survive in many different market environments. It can make money in anything because there's trends in every, every single thing. So as long as you're going across all these different assets, you're going to find lots of trends. So you find this new way of looking at things after all this, And when you're really doing that and you're doing that to that new level, 
and you're keeping open-minded and you're learning, you'll get to that next level of trading. But if you think about it and you hear somebody talk like, you know, there, I promise you there is not one, I mean, sorry, there's probably hedge funds that, that suck, that, that don't do it. But, but any of the good hedge funds, any of the good funds, any of the big banks, every single thing they do, they back test every single time. That's why Bloomberg has all the money in the world now and they do uh, their back testing environments on their systems now, which is an awesome thing to do. Like everything needs to be back tested. And I don't think it's just because, oh, it's you, it works. I think it's because our human bias will tell us a lot of things. You know, people look at the seventies and they go, yeah, gold and oil and everything just went up for that, you know, 20 years and everything was great. And we made all this money in commodities. So I'm just going to hold commodities for 10 years. Like, really, that wasn't the truth that, you know, these things went through massive drawdowns, you know, like 80% to 100% retracements. And, you know, like all of those things happened, and they were bad, but in people's brains, it's different. So you really have to back test to kind of weed out what's going on in your own head, because your brain, your brain will tell you everything is going to be great. And this trade is a great idea. And it's perfect. And then, then the next step, when you have the trade on when your money's in it, your brain will then tell you that it was a stupid idea and you need to get out of your trade immediately. So, you know, that leads you to have no confidence in your system. And if you don't have any confidence in your system or any confidence in your trading, uh, while well, you have good risk management, it just doesn't matter. It's kind of like I had how many people, I mean, you know this, how many people came up to me when I started the trade this uh, the in the end of last year in semiconductors? Everybody told me how stupid of a trade that was. It's a dumb trade semiconductors are stupid they're gonna go down by 50 percent one day you know for me all i knew is that this the trend was up my system has a stop in it so you know if i got stopped out there's no way i'd lose 50 percent. so what does it matter and it just gave me a signal and most of the time your best trades will happen when everybody's telling you it's stupid including yourself so that's where back testing comes in that ability to kind of tune out all the noise put on your your system and let it ride without second guessing yourself over and over again. Because for me, you know, I, and I've said this before, is like, you know, God could come down here and be like, you know, put his arm around me and be like, Jason, you know that I, I can see the future. And you know that semiconductor trade you have on is really fucking stupid. And I'd be like, damn, God, that sucks. I'm going to keep this semiconductor trade down, though. Sorry to tell you that. And I would just go from there. And that's like, that comes over time of, confidence in my back testing confidence in my systems and also the the single fact of knowing my risk management means that i'm just going to lose one percent of my account if i'm wrong but if i'm right who knows and luckily sometimes there's a who knows and as a as a trend following trader what i do is i'm trying to find outliers i'm not trying to find these things that you know new traders talk about like getting bottoms or tops or something I'm trying to find these trades that are going to be the ones that go up, you know, the commodities that go up 100% and double or Bitcoin that's going to go crazy or a trend in bonds that last for years, you know, like these are the trades I'm searching for. And the only way you get those is by continuing to put on those trades over time, over and over again, and not really giving a fuck about the outcome. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, I think that's a great way to to cap it off here, Jason. It's been a lot of fun talking to you and going over our ways of approaching trading. I hope it benefits everyone that's listening because really the idea here is if you can learn from the mistakes of others and the wisdom of others, then you're going to be well ahead on your trading journey versus where a lot of other people started and probably had to go through the school of hard knocks and pay some tuition to the market, learn some hard lessons and you know continue on their journey. So always be humble, honest with yourself and with the idea that the market is going to be the largest source where the most money is expressing its view as to what's happening now and looking into the future. And with that in mind, build systems off that and see where you can exploit inefficiency and find an edge. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you, man. Like you said, we'll end on that. That makes a lot of sense. I think we nailed some stuff. And I think the only thing to really add is like, this is really what trading is about. Like, yeah, we all get on and including myself, like I'm not, you know, I'm not a person who doesn't say what I'm thinking. Like we all think certain things, but what we're talking about here is really real trading. 
what we're really going to have to do as traders and how we grow as traders. So thanks so much for coming on, man. As always, it's a blast having you on. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. I look forward to the next time. Absolutely.